All right, well, welcome everyone. I'm Christine McGowan. I'm with the Vermont Sustainable Jobs Fund, and I just want to start by thanking everyone for being here. Um, it's really exciting. This is the second Vermont Forest Industry Summit, and uh, as I was looking through the registrations, I saw a lot of familiar faces, people who were here last year, so I think that's a great sign. People came back. Uh, it was really fun, and I expect we're going to have a lot of fun this year, too. But the really cool thing was that I actually saw a lot of new faces. So I'm looking out of the crowd and I'm definitely seeing some new faces, which is exciting. So I hope you all have time to get to know one another over the next 24 hours. Uh, we've got a lot in store for you, so I'm really looking forward to this. Um, but less than a year ago in this room, we launched the Vermont Forest Industry Network. And the purpose of this network is to bring together people from across the various supply chains to address challenges and seize opportunities facing our forest and wood products industry together. So since then, we've established a new network steering committee that includes representatives from all the key trade organizations, oops, um, agencies, and other industry leaders who all have a strong interest in seeing our forest and wood products industry thrive. That steering committee will meet later this month and we'll be examining all of the takeaways from the summit with an eye toward developing new projects based on the ideas that come out of our time together. So since the network launched uh, a year ago, and even less than a year ago, it's been really busy. Um, our Mass Timber Action Team recently co-hosted an event in Burlington with the Vermont Green Building Network called Mass Timber and Embodied Carbon that explored the future of how we build and engaged some of Burlington's largest architectural firms that have reaches well beyond Vermont. Um, they do a lot of projects in Boston, New York, and other parts of the country. And they've expressed a growing interest in using mass timber and with using more Vermont wood in general in their projects. So we're really excited about that. We've even gotten the state of Vermont interested in possibly building its next state office building out of mass timber. And we've recently been invited to join our counterparts in Maine in creating a regional strategy to support the growing mass timber industry in the Northeast, thinking about how to leverage the skills and strengths that each of our states brings to the table. In March, we co-hosted a biochar meetup with the We Love Forestry Committee to explore the potential of biochar as a viable forest product. And that event featured two Vermont companies that are producing biochar, and just yesterday, a subset of those who attended traveled to New Hampshire to tour an ROI machine, which is a portable machine that can make biochar out of scrap wood on a log landing. So if any of you are going to the Northeastern Loggers Expo in a couple weeks up in Maine, it's gonna be on display there as well. We've continued to execute an industry-wide communication strategy with a focus on helping to elevate the profile of the industry among Vermonters and visitors through telling stories about the people and businesses that help keep our forests as forests. Some of the stories we've been producing are included in the newspaper that is in your bag, and they're all found online at vsjf.org, on Facebook, and on the network's new Instagram and Twitter accounts at vs, I'm sorry, at VT Forest, uh, at VT Forest Network. So if you are on Twitter or Instagram, please follow us there. And at tonight's dinner, you're gonna see another story, The Life of a Tree, a, product made, a, a project made possible by the generous support of Cabot Creamery Cooperative that follows the life of a tree as seen through the eyes of everyone who helps it along its journey from the woods to become the products we depend on. So much has evolved since we were here in Burke less than a year ago. Back then, we kicked off the summit with a discussion about the future of our forests that just barely scratched the surface of an important conversation that we all need to be having. <coughs> what do we want the future of our forests to be? And what is our role in making that future a reality? So today, we're gonna continue that conversation. So I want you to take a deep breath, relax, and let the rush of the morning that you just had drain away. Give yourself permission to take a step back and to get up a bit in elevation above the day-to-day -day pressures that you just left behind. So what does the future hold for our forests? It's a big question, and it's one that doesn't have a simple answer. 
There are so many aspects to think about, so many perspectives to consider. So in planning the discussion we're about to have, we narrowed the focus down to three buckets, so to speak, of discussion that are interrelated. The first has to do with forest health and composition. And one of the big issues we face is how to address the decline in markets for low-grade wood. But maybe that's not the right question, or maybe it's not the only question. Maybe we should question how much low-grade wood we grow in our forests in the future. And we can't talk about forest health without considering the increase in pests and diseases threatening our forests, particularly in the face of climate change. This slide is tent caterpillar defoliation. And of course, this next one is our latest friend to uh, visit Vermont, the emerald ash borer. So how do we plan for the future, knowing that pest and disease pressures are likely to rise? Of course, it wouldn't make sense to have a conversation about the future of our Vermont forests without considering the future of maple syrup production. I saw this recent blog post on Landvest's website about the scale of tapping, tapping happening in Vermont. It's 400,000 taps and expected in the next few years. That's a lot of taps. And of course, here we are in Burke, home to one of the fastest growing hubs of mountain biking in our region. Forest-based rec forest recreation is growing and it comes with both challenges and opportunity. So how do we better connect the interests of recreation with the interests of our forest and wood products industry? So we've asked Deputy Commissioner Sam Lincoln and a distinguished panel of people who represent a variety of forest stakeholders to contemplate these and other questions. Now in the short time we have, we know this will only scratch the surface, but it will be a start to what I hope will be a continuing dialogue that helps to inform how we plan for a sustainable future for our forests and for our industry. So you'll notice on your tables there are some four by six cards and some pens. So as you listen to the discussion, if you have a burning question, please feel free to write it down. Some of us are gonna be floating around the room and we're gonna be taking those cards. And if we have time, I will hand a couple to Sam to ask the panelists to respond. But please don't worry, because if we don't have time, because we've got a lot that we're going to talk about, um, please write down those questions and make sure you hand them in to us, because we are going to take those. I'm going to be compiling all of the questions, and the Network Steering Committee is going to be reading them and considering all of them as we make plans for the future year. So please sit back, relax, and I'm going to turn the program over to our Deputy Commissioner of Forest Parks and Recreation, Sam Lincoln, who is going to introduce our panel and moderate this important discussion. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you for being here today for this important discussion. Uh, now I know when I was in High school no, uh, nominated is most likely to be a game show host. Now I, it's all <laughs> coming true. Uh, so uh, we're talking about the future of forests, and what better than a panel of uh, distinguished folks like this to kick it off? And we're uh, I'll, I'll start right here in no particular order with uh, Charlie Hancock from Northwoods Forestry. Commissioner Snyder, my colleague from the Department of Forest Parks and Recreation, Mark Isselhart, uh, UVM's ex Extensions Maple Specialist, uh, Mike Greenville from Maple Landmark, Abby Long from Kingdom Trails, and Kenny Gagna from Gagna Lumber. And uh, So it wouldn't be uh, right to start a discussion about the future of forests if we didn't just do a check-in about where we're at right now. And and talk about the status of our forest. Uh, Commissioner Snyder, can you start this discussion off and give us a status report on the forest, where are our strengths and where are our threats in Vermont? Sure, thanks. Thank you, Sam. I'm happy to do that uh, relatively quickly, I think. I would say that uh, I think we all know we are very lucky. We are, as I like to say, forest strong in Vermont, meaning we are more than three quarters forested. It's generally in very good condition and there are massive benefits that come to all of us from that. Uh, th 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 we are still, uh, it, it seems, uh, at a stage of growth exceeding removals in terms of forestry and, and use of, of forests, uh, and that's all to the good. Uh, I'd say it's only fair to indicate that we there are certain threats 
we think of sustainability of, for, of anything really as a three-legged stool. Certainly forests is the ecological, economic, and cultural. So I look at the sort of status of Vermont's forest as those three pieces. Ecologically, again, I think we're in a pretty good place. There are real threats. Uh, certain uh, increased mortality, certain species seeing uh, decreased growth. Um, we are generally in a, uh, an age and a stand development stage uh, that is in some ways uh, what we would call stem exclusion, uh, which means kind of a closed canopy, not a lot going on in the understory, and a little bit stagnant over many decades. So that's of concern, just the sort of nature of the stage of development of a sort of typical forest stand. A lot of the variation there, obviously, but that's a generalization. Um, uh, I think we're seeing shifts in some species composition that I think of concern some folks, like increasing beech and increasing red maple uh, in the mix, uh, the historical mix of species on the land. Um, and I think the biggest uh, ecological threat would be, uh, or among the most, would be, as Christine mentioned, invasives, invasive pests, invasive pathogens, and invasive plants. Uh, Outcompeting native plants, killing trees, disrupting uh, function of ecosystems. That's pretty significant, and there's a lot of it, and we seem to have a hard time stopping it and uh, re responding to it, in, at least in the short term. So I think generally good, some threats to the ecology of the forest, and then I would say the economy and the cultural aspects. Similarly, uh, among the chief threats, I think, to our forest and the, uh, something we have to consider when we're talking about the future of our forest would be kind of an awareness gap, a cultural gap in the importance of forests and the role of forestry. <laughs> Uh, speaking to the choir here, but there's an awful lot of people out there who get emails who still have a problem with cutting trees, don't understand how much wood is involved in their lives, uh, and how important it is, how renewable it is, what our history and traditions are, what our future possibilities are. I think that cultural gap is a real threat to the future of Vermont's forests as well. Uh, and then we all know there are significant economic challenges and doing business in the current circumstances, globalization, and other pressures. So that's my quick overview, Sam, is that I'd say uh, the status is we're in pretty darn good shape, some ecological threats, some cultural and economic challenges. Uh, and I would finish my opening here by saying that I am increasingly convinced that a strong, viable, local forest economy is, um, is our best chance to combat all of those challenges and keep forests forest. Excellent, thank you. Um, so we're not gonna solve every problem that comes up. We can discuss the status of various opportunities and challenges and explore the possibilities and potential solutions to these issues. Uh, and they will set the stage for the next 24 hours and give you a lens to view these issues through as you attend the breakout sessions and network with others that are here for the summit. So with that, we'll start off with one of our forest health and composition questions. Um, and Charlie, this one's coming your way. Uh, Charlie, what should we anticipate in the future when it comes to the composition of our forests? Are there species that will thrive or suffer as climates and other pressures play out? How might we all in the industry and the forest economy plan differently for this complex future? Yeah, thanks, Sam. Um, sorry, this mic is too bad. Just this thing out, I'll change it. Um, yeah, so I do think there's going to be changes and shifts in, um, in species composition. As we all know, climate change is probably where this conversation tends to go the most. Um, we're going to see changes in precipitation, disturbance events, um, temperature fluctuations. And so uh, being such, we're going to see shifts in what species can be best on what sites. And so that will inform our management about uh, what species we're managing for. Um, and I'd say that the, the, the big takeaway from that, at least from my perspective, is uh, we want to keep, keep all the parts, keep the opportunity uh, going forward. Um, a lot of the shifts we see, whether it's climate change or some of the more kind of immediate ones, shifts in markets, um, you know, whether it's like the collapse that happened back in the 2000s or the low rate wood market collapses, um, or other things that tend to happen pretty pretty rapidly in the long term time frame of things, whereas changes in forest composition tend to happen over a long period of time. And so in terms of being nimble to respond to that, I think keeping the diversity um, and the opportunity out there by keeping all those parts is where we as the manager of those forests need to have our heads to basically adapt to that change. Great. Anybody else want to jump in on that one? Another forester by chance on the uh, panel? All right. Um, 
Ken, I'm going to put this one to you, and anybody should feel free on the panel here to, to, to uh, jump in on any of these. Wood markets are increasingly global in nature. Uh, where should Vermont be specializing uh, in a particular species or products? Um, should we be looking at forest services instead of forest products by chance? What, what do you see from your perspective at the mill over on the western side of the state? Um, I, well, I see a lot of people out here today, that's for sure. And I'm, not used to sitting quite up like this. I feel like a, a table right here in front of me would be nice. <laughs> but I'm getting used to it. <laughs> you got this, Ken. <laughs> uh, so I don't think politics is where I want to go. Uh, but uh, on the, you know, for me, I think Vermont, uh, it, it's our, our, our valuable hardwoods that we've had, and, and particularly the, the white hardwoods have been our mainstay uh, in terms of the market in the U.S. and in the world. Um, obviously, number one's been our maple, which used to be just a pretty plain Jane kind of item, but now it's, it's, uh, it's been a steady demand item. Um, we've for my business, that's, that's probably one of the main, how you say, headliners for us is the, the hard maple. That's, that does go through a number of the, uh, the ebbs and flows. Um, I guess the, 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 I'd, I'd say I'm, I'm hopeful that that will remain a solid part of our piece. And, 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 and the, you know, being in the Northeast, there's only so many parts of the world that grows uh, maple like we grow it here. Um, so I think in the long term for the forest products industry, keeping that product as part of our mix in a, in a very sustainable way is, is in my mind, the key. Um, other species that we have uh, lesser of, and we're at the one right now that's causing acid indigestion is, is which you wouldn't normally think of as red oak. Is is a year ago it was it was easy. Now this this is yeah. This last almost a year it's been a struggle, um, and it's all got to do with a bigger trade, international trade, trade tariffs. Um, I'm not. That's that's a tough one, um, and uh, for us. We, we're, our flexibility in being able to meet a number of different markets, One, we do both hardwood and softwood, so we, we, can, we can move from, uh, from the different species. So bottom line for me, I'm really happy to be in a place that has such a variety as we have. We have, we have a lot of great hardwoods, and we've got some great, we have got a great, our softwood species are strong. Um, what little bit I get to travel around the country, we are, I come back here and I say, wow, we've got, we have a real, we have a variety on our, on our, our grocery list out there. So mm -hmm. um, challenges, yes, but um, I guess I'm, I'm pretty okay being where I am here now. So you, that's great, that, and you're talking about dirt, sod lumber, dimensional lumber, and things. What about other products? You, you know, your mill, you invested in other, other uh, outlets and yep. and uh, things like that. What else do you see going on? So, uh, you know, the initiative under uh, expanding the uh, the wood heating market is is also very uh, important to us. Um, over the last 20 years, we've kind of specialized a little bit on the uh, institutional heating through the uh, wood chip market, which is, is still a niche um, in the scheme of things. Um, so we liken ourselves to being uh, a local fuel delivery system. Um, and um, it's, it certainly has a chance to add value. Uh, and we're really looking forward to hoping that you know, uh, larger institutions will start to, it, it seems like it's, uh, it needs some, uh, how you say, some more propagation. We'd like to see some more institutions pick it up. Um, and uh, because I think on the, on the regional scale, wood chips are uh, very val valuable if it's kept within reasonably locally. Um, and, 
uh, but we still need those larger chip using uh, institutions such as Burlington Electric, the paper companies. It's 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 not a it's not a one size. It's definitely we need to keep those those parts going to, to keep the system. Uh, it's you know obviously for us if we lose. Uh, a, a larger school, which is that happens. Schools come and schools ebb and flow. Um, it's it would be important for us to see that yep. out there. Mike, anything from your perspective at the at your business with the with the globalization, global markets, and economy for wood products coming out of Vermont? Uh, well, there's there's both sides of it, I guess. Uh, material wise. You know, we really focus on Vermont material in, in my company. Uh, we are heavily impacted by the global economy as far as competition as to where products are made. And, and I'm sitting here I, uh, representing uh, the secondary side of the industry. That people make things out of wood. Uh, in my company specifically, we make small wood products, toys, games, and gifts, and things like that. Uh, we're uh, pre pretty, pretty active in a lot of different markets. Uh, the foreign competition is is serious, but it's been there for a couple decades or, or longer, so we've kind of learned to deal with it. Uh, on the supply side, it, broadly in, in the sector, there there's disconnects to, to the to Vermont uh, grown material because in like in the furniture industry, which is a big part of the secondary industry in Vermont, a lot of the demand is, through the years has been cherry, and. It, to get the cherry that people want or have wanted in the past meant, you know, meant very well going to Pennsylvania uh, to get both volume and quality. Uh, I, I, I hear from some members of the industry now changing tastes in, in they, they, you know, the, the, the industrial look that people want or the rough hewn look. It's less. It's more about the look and less about the the species of material. And I think there's opportunities there for. Uh, uh, for you know, any kind of species, but it, it's it's hard to then find the material because it's it's truly a niche. Nobody's going to be supplying a, a truckload or buying a truckload of that kind of material. It's a, it's a matter of connecting up um, unique materials to unique jobs that woodworkers have. So, you know, th there's. There have been through the years many disconnects between the side, the primary, the supply side, and those of us that use it. And you know, there, there are opportunities there for sure if people were, you know, could get together and talk about them. Yep. So, where do any of you think that we can, and anybody on the panel, where do you think we can promote Vermont's forest brand? We've got various places where you enter, where where you turn around from the forests of Vermont, and you're facing the public in your role in a different way. Where do you think we can? Where do you think we can best capitalize on the Vermont forest brand throughout throughout your various sectors? I'll chime in. Uh, you know, I, obviously, I'm here to talk a little bit about maple, and I think a lot of times the imagery of maple is rooted in a pretty narrow, in a pretty narrow story. Mm -hmm. Probably rooted in the mid 1800s. Probably involving you know a guy and a oxen and that sort of thing. <laughs> and when I talk about maple, I try to really incorporate the whole cycle, the whole year. You know, I'm talking about a living plant. It's incredibly well adapted to the climate, um, flourishes in, in the climate that we have now. Uh, there are obviously concerns going forward, but sugar makers work all year round to promote promote healthy and, and make this unique product. So I think telling the story beyond like the nice sparkly bottle of syrup, which is amazing, but you know, telling the story about the plant, telling the story about what it takes to to grow a healthy sugar bush, um, will tell the story of Vermont's forests. I jump in, take a shot at Please do. Uh, and by the way, I'll take door number three. Door number three for two hundred. <laughs> um, Similarly to how Mark is seeing this, I guess I would say, I would echo that and say that, well, I, on the one hand, I'd love it if Vermont's brand extended to people all over the world saying, I want Vermont wood products, for, for example, like capitalize on our brand, similar to there's a, an element of quality and authenticity about our maple that people just know. Love it if people thought that way about our wood products too. Uh, I think there's a potential for things like pellets to be like Vermont pellets are the maple of the wood energy world, that they're, they're just the best and everyone knows it and knows why. Um, 
But I would say another maybe more realistic possibility for branding and capitalizing on the brand, and perhaps to bring Abby into this a little bit, would be to capitalize on the, the love that people have for uh, in the growing interest in all form and diversification of outdoor recreation. Um, think about it. Our, we have a huge part of, uh, Ken Jones is here, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but a big piece of our economy is tourism. A uh, big piece of that is people who come look at leaves, <laughs> and uh, it's significant. Similarly, outdoor recreation factors in. I think they're not just consistent with a working forest and a forested landscape, they're kind of dependent on it. And the people who come here uh, are coming here in part because it seems healthy and authentic, it's green, it's nice. It's a good place to ride your mountain bike. Uh, in part because of the trees and maybe connecting those things as some of you are and telling that story that they're not just compatible, they're consistent and mutual uh, and supportive of each other uh, and to build on the similar to I think people have a general um, interest in wildlife and a real interest in songbirds in particular, which is why the Foresters for the Birds program was so successful. Because you're building on that resonance that people have already, and then connect them to, well, and there's forest management involved. Uh, I see that as a, as a hopeful avenue for us to connect and build on this, this brand. Abby? Yes, please. Consider yourself teed up, Yes, Abby. thank you, Michael. <laughs> it's segue. Like, I was reaching for the mic before, too. Um, but absolutely, I wholeheartedly agree with Michael that adding recreation to the forest industry could provide that new brand that you're all asking for. Um, Kingdom Trails specifically, that's all I can speak for. Um, we, we absolutely understand and appreciate the traditional um, forest industry that our communities here in Burke, Lindenville, the entire Northeast Kingdom, um, the communities were founded on. And rather than displacing them, we, we really just wish to deepen our relationships, our partners with the loggers, the tappers, the mill, um, the foresters, um, everyone, every um, stage of the game. And, and we do that through, through communication, and I think, and education. You know, you guys, someone spoke earlier about the cultural gap that's, that's happening with the forests um, in the state. And I believe by um, outdoor recreation, trails specifically, that's how you get people into your forest to enjoy them, to connect with the forest. Um, especially youth, if, if we encourage them to be active and outside, they're gonna grow up in loving and respecting their forests. Great. Anybody else on that one? Mike? Uh, there's many different levels or directions for branding, and I, I think the things that we sometimes talk about when we, when we meet, but we don't always do a really good job of pulling it or finding ways to pull it together is, and, and Mike mentioned earlier, that kind of the disconnects of people's understanding, even Vermonters' understanding of, of our forests and, and the value. We need to do a better job of, of, of branding ourselves within our own within our own state, within policymakers and, and such. Uh, you know, there's been a lot of you know we all look at agriculture and all the good, great stories about local food and, and and all of that, and we you know we have an opportunity to do that better than we do now. And maybe what we're going to see tonight in the video might might inspire some of us. I haven't seen it yet, but uh, uh, and then we hear in, in the wood products industry there are these disconnects that uh, the furniture makers aren't necessarily using Vermont material, but that's not unusual. And in, in agriculture, how much of our food leaves Vermont? How much of what we eat comes from outside Vermont? That doesn't necessarily matter to the story when there's a lot that does cross connect. And let's tell that story and get people to understand the value of it. Maybe maybe we can get the brain in a better place. All right, Ken? Uh, just one thing I'd like to chime in a little bit about, and I think the, the ideal of education, and uh, let me try that thing. <laughs> don't, don't, don't do that. Don't do that. <laughs> has been that folks that come here um, 
don't, they don't understand the forestry industry and uh, the opportunities for us in the forestry industry to, to tell our story through maybe connecting with the recreational industry when those folks are out there getting, I don't want to call it, our storyboard out there about how these trails are there in the first place and what's keeping this forest a forest. Um, it's that whole reach across where somebody coming from southern New England say, you know, they, they, they start to get a picture of, of what's going on, of that the, these trails are here because of the, of the historical use. Uh, and then I think on the, on the maple side, the Vermont maple, from the syrup side, really got a, a brand identification. So in being able to to uh, help to collaborate those two things together, I see as a, another, so that people start connecting the wood that we have with this great, these two great, that these products are together, that, that they're not two separate things. Um, I obviously, as, a, as a, a larger producer, my wood doesn't really have a, a special brand, um, but I'd like to see that you know opportunity come, and that's I think that's in in my for the wood products industry. The more little special niches you can get to help your overall uh, business, that's that's going to make the difference. So. One of the things I think we we are talking about is this awareness gap of, of the, the all of us that are invested in forests and forest management and health and things um, what in, in terms of branding and connecting that where any of you have a particular way or place that you've bridged that awareness gap that you've been particularly effective in any of your realms that you work in where you've seen those aha moments that are good things for people to carry away from here today that they can be thinking about tomorrow when they interact with the public that may not understand forestry as well in thinking about the brand the the uh, what would you want them to know from all the people here to, when you turn and represent the industry I think um, I can speak first to this Kingdom Trails actually um, probably debuting in the next couple of weeks once the ground fully thaws and we can um, open our trails but um, we kind of going back to the education component, but also now working with the forest, new forestry brand to highlight the new working landscape, including recreation. Um, Kingdom Shells has been working on educational signage. Um, we've had a number of successful logging operations that have happened across our trails. Also, um, many of our landowners who generously allow us to cross their properties, lease their land or, or do their own maple tapping. So when our um, trail users are out there, they're driving by um, stacks of logs or they might see an area that was disturbed a little bit from an operation or they might be dodging tap lines as they bike. Um, and so, I believe it's through that educational signage that we can highlight all of those relationships that we have and collaboration efforts. And on that signage, we can not only share that Kingdom Trail celebrates the traditional landscape, but that it is healthy forest management to, you know, cut the poor quality or the declining trees, that it is healthy to, you know, highlight all the success that the forest industry has. Um, and what else it can do, you know, providing local heat in the winter, providing jobs in the winter, um, anywhere from the truck driver to the logger to the, um, to the mill. Uh, I mean, we can num a, a number of that. And, and Kingdom Trails is extremely fortunate that we see, last year we saw 140,000 vis visits to our trails. Um, and that's a lot of folks flying by. And, uh, you know, we put our signs right in areas where they congregate and can hang out and check out those signs. So we're pleased that we have that opportunity to share the story with them. Nice. Anybody else? Bridging the awareness gap? Uh, I, similarly, I, you know, in our state parks, uh, campgrounds, and we have forest management nearby, we uh, try to make that known to campers and uh, tell the story, and just to continue that sort of signage and interpretation and uh, programming, and we're not hiding it, we're, we're bragging about it. And uh, I'd like to think that we do that through a lot, as one example, but through the department, that's kind of our mission, in, in part, is to uh, help spread the word, tell the story, educate, answer questions. 
um, and um, empower people. The Cut With Confidence campaign was exactly that, to help landowners understand, you know, this set of comprehensive guidelines for protecting forest health during forestry will make it more user-friendly and, and uh, empower landowners to feel like they have confidence to do this well. Uh, those are, we're looking for all kinds of any idea that we can think of. I know Charlie's got a few comments. <laughs> yeah, I think, um, I mean, the main connection it seems like we're trying to make is, well, if we want to grow the industry and support it, right, we want advocates. We want more people who buy into what we love. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't think we have to go out and create them. We just have to kind of pull them in and, and kind of go to where they are. Um, Mike mentioned in the Foresters for the Birds program, I can't tell you how many landowners I've worked with who just love black of the warblers or scarlet tanagers and they're out there with their binoculars up and everything and, and when they make that connection that active management that can diversify forest structure um, to provide benefits to the habitat of birds they love you know the light goes off in their eyes and that's an advocate that's someone that no longer drives by a landing and kind of thumbs their nose at it but sees the benefit to it or the backcountry skier. I mean, I had a timber sale in Belvedere this year, and there were days when I couldn't get to the landing because there was so many cars parked there for skiers who got there before I did, which is amazing. These folks don't have jobs, apparently. <laughs> um, but when I connect with them when I'm in the woods and talk about, hey, you know, where you're skinning up is a truck road, and where you're coming down is where we did a, and this is where we might start to lose and talking about, and funnel schlogs and stuff, but talking about how active management is creating those glades and how that is creating what they what they love and connecting them to that. So it's it's finding what what spins their wheels and how do we connect it to the role of active management in our woods that that or we're engaged with. So that's gonna basically it's not expand the base, it's bring the base together, I think. I would just add that you know, the awareness gap, I don't know if you were specifically talking about Vermonters or, you know, I heard Southern New England mentioned, you know, as well, but I mean, we, we at the Proctor Center, we give tours all the time to different age groups, um, as well as aspiring sugar makers, and there's an awareness gap at the very local level as well, and, and just talking about, you know, the, the basic process can do a lot to to, to share that awareness gap. You don't have to get very far beyond uh, the point of production that um, the, the knowledge drops right off. So I, I wouldn't necessarily focus all the attention on, on the out-of-state gap of, uh, gap of knowledge. I'll, I'll jump in there with the clear, I meant like, all of us, yeah. Okay, yeah. yeah. And I'll, I'll jump in there before Abby. Uh, you know, uh, Commissioner Snyder, I told him this story last night. I was sitting in the State House yesterday, and uh, uh, anybody who knows the State House cafeteria, it's very busy, and people often sit together that have no connection. And um, someone sat down next to me, and uh, as the conversation went on, they basically introduced themselves as someone who didn't like logging very much, and they were and they didn't know who I was. And um, it was they talked about thinking about. Um, too much logging going on in the state, there wasn't enough protection of wetlands and various things, and it was uh, a great relief to me to be able to turn to this gentleman and calmly say that I was, uh, after being in the field with our staff earlier in the week looking at wetlands in the southern part of the state and how logging's gone on and good protection in buffer zones and all the good work that's going on by logging contractors with the assistance and the training and education from our staff, Dave Wilcox here, our watershed forester, um, has trainings planned across the state next week and it was uh, that gap, being able to bridge that gap with that gentleman and explain to him all the good things that are going on because of the work of the department and the work of you all, the landowners, the foresters, the logging contractors. Um, it, was, uh, it was sort of the first time that I'd really encountered something like that in my role here and uh, my fingerprints are probably still in the table where I was hanging on there. But, <laughs> But it was a great, I was very proud to be able to answer him confidently about the work that goes on in our forests and things like that. So, Abby? Um, I just wanted to quick mention that the best idea to share this new brand would be to invite everyone to the Tiki Bar in the center of East Burke. And while we're at the Tiki Bar enjoying a beverage, we'll share that the Tiki Bar is actually um, a logger, a local logger, and his mill is right there behind the Tiki Bar. And he's just been able to tap into the economic um, visitors of Kingdom Trails and provide free parking for all the trail users and 
make a dime off, you know, when they're done with their ride, they have it just stop and have a drink, and while well, he's still able to successfully operate his mill. So we'll do that. <laughs> Dive into that bar. <laughs> I'm sure there's been some awareness uh, created there. So uh, just following along, I, uh, I, I love to hike, and my daughter loves to hike, so I've had a chance to hike on a whole bunch of trails, including the long trail. She did it end to end last year, and I did parts pieces, which was good. But I couldn't help but think as I went, I'd come to sections in the in the landscape, and I said, boy, this really could stand some PLC. Um, it really, you know, there's some areas that, God, it, it, you know, it, like there'd be some areas where it might have been a, a, some severe wind damage, and I'm thinking, boy, there's, you know, if I owned this land, I'd be taking care of it. And I'm, you know, and I realized that there's a very wide no-touch zone, if you want, I'm calling it a no-touch zone, but the, the long trail has a pretty wide buffer strip. And I would love to invite the opportunities to open that up to some opportunities to share what the forest industry does. Um, so, and I know Mike wants it, and I'm going to give it, I'll give it to you in a second. <laughs> and that's, and I think I've seen it on, on State Lands Trail, that there's some places that I could take you, Mike, right down in my neck of the woods, and I, well, this is a couple years ago, that we, I'd love to see a little project go on there and put some nice, you know, do some storyboards and say, hey, this is what's going on. And I think, not only for the for the uh, for the casual hikers who are from all over the the world. I mean, they would hopefully start to say something. And then I'm going to just throw one more out because it was kind of a funny thing I thought of as I was hiking behind my daughter. She wants to just go. I like to stop and say hi to folks on the way. You know, as a girl, I like to say hi. She does not like that, but. I'm thinking, God, what a great ministry to walk along being the walking logger. <laughs> I mean, the people you meet on the trail, they don't have a clue of what they're walking through. Uh, you know, I ran into a group uh, from an arboretum in, in, in Boston, and they were looking for sassafras down, down very close to the uh, mass border. It was just a little ways. I got a little idea what I said. I think I might have seen one, but I, I, I said, I don't, you know, I, I got an idea what sassafras is, and it might be down there. But as they went further north, of course, the, the lovely thing is you start, in, you start in Mass, and it's a lot of oak, there's a lot of hickory, and by the time you get to Belvedere, and the time you get north, it's a whole different world. But a lot of the hikers we ran into, they didn't, they didn't know, they had a lot of, they knew about the rocks. There's a lot of rocks. So, <laughs> I know. But back to you, Mike. <laughs> Thank you, Kenny. I would, I would like, just to be fair, and I completely agree with your general point there, but to be fair to the Green Mountain Club, steward of the Long Trail, their executive director, Mike DeBonis, who's a forester, uh, they're, they're, that's 272 miles? 273. Uh, and a lot of different landowners, and they get to decide mostly. Uh, and for example, through Long Trail State Forest, uh, there's active logging in Belvedere. Uh, and the Green Mountain Club has been very open to our requests to say, let's show some of this and let's have some views into the active management and explain it. So it's happened. What you're asking for is happening. And I just, I got, you know, to be fair to them, uh, Mike's been great about that and they support it. Looking forward to it. Yeah. So uh, uh, I'm going to shift a little bit um, about recreation as a forest product. Um, Commissioner Snyder and then, and then Abby, please chime in too. Uh, how's Vermont going to, how might we demonstrate leadership for the other states in modeling successful strategies that balance the needs of forest users? We've covered a little bit of this already, but what do you, you, you know, through the VOLREC initiative, the governor's initiative, and the, um, and you're representing a national level, and Abby, maybe touch on some of your experiences, where we can show everybody else the, the right way to do it. I can start. Go ahead, okay. please. I'll let Michael talk about BOREC, but, but I'd like to share that um, Kingdom Trails is proud to be part of the Vermont Trail System, and I believe this is something extremely unique to Vermont. Um, I just moved from the state of Colorado, and um, I'll, I'll say it, you know, there are a lot of rogue trails out there that are unsanctioned, they are built willy-nilly by someone out of their backyard, and, and those trails are what give official trail networks a bad name. Um, 
being a part of the Vermont Trail system, we abide by certain standards that the state sets. This falls under Michael's, um, under his commission, and um, and there's proper signage to these trails and 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 management. And so, uh, uh, Kingdom Trails is proud to be a part of that system. I know Vast is Vasa, the Long Trail, also Hadamount Mount Trail, um, and Vimba, a number of other mountain bike trail networks around the state. And and we're thrilled that there actually is this higher being that that can um, that we can look to for leadership. And and I think that right there is an example that other states can can learn by. Quickly, VORec is an acronym uh, for Vermont Outdoor Recreation Economic Collaborative. Those are all, all the words I think are really important. They say a lot. It's about Vermont, it's about outdoor recreation, it's about economics, and it's through a collaborative approach. This was an initiative of Governor Scott through executive order to create it, to basically say uh, Vermont has this incredible landscape, a culture and history of people being outdoors and a vigorous outdoor life, and that if you combine those, take care of those assets, our landscape, the built infrastructure, boat ramps and ski areas, for example, that kind of thing, trails, uh, and the culture, you can leverage those assets for greater economic good. That's the premise. And uh, it was just intentional to, to say, let's have, first have an intentional approach to economic development through outdoor recreation. There's, so there's outdoor recreation, and then there's the outdoor economy, the businesses that are related directly and indirectly to outdoor recreation. And that, um, uh, so this was an intent, uh, an, uh, an initiative to uh, provide a platform for input from all over Vermont, from stakeholders, landowners, businesses, uh, nonprofits, uh, volunteer organizations to help us be intentional about planning for economic development through outdoor recreation. That's the basic idea. It's really been well received throughout the state in, in communities, as towns are saying, and community groups saying, we want to do this. We like this idea. Uh, so that's all to the good. I think the point I would make about uh, what, how to connect it to other states or to lead or what to do with it is that um, this is historic in that there's been many economic development initiatives initiatives led by the state or this and that over many, many years. This one's different in two real ways. One is it's a, the only economic development initiative that's ever been sort of rooted and housed in environmental quality. It's all about the landscape uh, and that it's this collaborative approach. So in other words, it's, I'm the chair of OREC by design, by the governor's choice, not the secretary of commerce because it is an economic, whereas it is an economic development initiative, it's, need, it, it's intended to be built on this working landscape. The other thing I'd say is nationally, I do get to play that role on a national stage with other states that are saying similar things. Let's plant a flag for the power of outdoor recreation, for human health, for environmental connectedness, and for economic development. And whereas in the West, that's been in response to a collapse of traditional extractive industries. This is like a replacement for that. And here, it's not. It's complementary to our working landscape. Uh, and in the West, it's in reaction to a loss of access to lands. And here, it's the opposite. We have this fantastic tradition of people, we have some posting issues in my view, but we have this tradition of people letting people on their land and laws that support landowners, liability laws that limit one's exposure liability-wise when you let somebody recreate on your land. So we are already leading in the outdoor space uh, and we're, within less than a day's drive of 80 million people, when I told that to the director of the Colorado Office of Outdoor Economy, his jaw dropped. They would give anything. They have the Rockies, we got all the people, and some pretty damn nice mountains ourselves. <laughs> Wooded, forested mountains. So we've gotten our exercise a little bit, we've worked our brains a little bit. Let's move on to our stomachs here. Let's get to the maple production side of things. Um, Mark, uh, Vermont continues to reign as the largest producer of maple syrup in the country. Uh, doesn't show any sign of th that stopping. What concerns do maple producers have about the future of this industry and the resources needed to sustain it? No, no concerns whatsoever. None? All right, next question. Uh, you know, Maple is this odd amalgam of, of uh, agriculture, forestry, food production, um, wizardry, wizardry, uh, 
it kind of depends on the time scale you're talking about. So uh, you're not going to find a, a, a farmer more concerned about one or two degrees Fahrenheit. Maybe maybe some orchard, you know, maybe some people who grow apples or other fruit crops. But you can be intensely aware about subtle changes in temperature, and that's a big concern in the short term. Um, long term, obviously, climate change issues um, are, are are a big deal. And then there's the medium term. In general, maple is strong in Vermont. It always has been. Uh, we have the climate, we have the resource, we have a long-standing tradition. Uh, other states have maybe two or three of those, or you know, one or two of those components, but uh, you can have the trees and you can have the climate, but if you don't have the people with the know-how, you're not gonna necessarily produce as much syrup as Vermont does. Incidentally, uh, right now, the season just wrapped up, although there might be a few people making a little bit of buddy syrup right now, but uh, in general, the season's over, and uh, the early indications are that it was, a, it was a good crop in general. But we still produce maybe a fifth of what we produced 100 years ago. Um, and, and that has more to do with the changes in, in agriculture, going from a more agrarian uh, economy to, to what we're in now. It was more diffuse across the landscape, and now we're seeing far fewer operations producing more and more syrup. So um, when I ask producers, in all seriousness, what are the concerns? Uh, overproduction in the short term. But if you talk to people who are in the business of buying a lot of syrup, like Emma Marvin, who should have been sitting right here, uh, she would say there's growth in the marketplace. And that overproduction in the short term might be an issue, but there's a lot of people in the world. What do you think about, oh, sorry. And just a lot of people who have never had maple syrup. And so um, it's a lot, it's a, it, it's a lot of work to make maple syrup, but it's easier to add taps than it is to sell syrup in Japan or you know somewhere else in the world. So the, the market expansion has been a little slower to, to increase compared to production. Um, but I think, I think there's a, a very good outlook uh, for, for maple production. A lot of concerns, um, and my undergrad degree is in forest management, so I share some of the concerns that I've heard from the forestry community about the change in how maple is produced, and or maybe the scale. So uh, it's an interesting time for sure. There's, the, it's, it's not like maple was made in the old days, but I don't necessarily think that's inherently bad, um, and I don't think there's an, necessarily a number of taps that all of a sudden kicks you into a new realm and that somehow it's worse when you cross that threshold. I think good active management is important. Um, you know, growing healthy trees to make up for what's removed from tapping, that's all important and at, no matter what scale. Yeah. What do you think the market for organic or bird friendly syrup or some of these these uh, ideas are? What, what do you think, you see opportunity there or is it? I think those are two different, like organic has the name recognition worldwide, you know, the, the organic movement started and has been growing. And so if consumers are in the store and choosing to buy organic products and they see an organic alternative for maple, they're going to probably invest in that. Um, there isn't a huge difference, obviously, in, in the production, although you, there are a few things you have to do differently if you're making organ, certified organic syrup. The biggest thing is the third party certification. The premium paid to producers for organic syrup is not what it was. Um, it's chipped away a little bit, but it, there's still a premium paid and it works in the producer's favor if you are at a certain scale to make that, that extra premium. Um, a lot of it comes down to consumer education. You know, a lot of people don't know what maple syrup is in the first place, let alone you know, bird friendly. But I think those stories that go along with, hey, we're managing our forest for not just huge, old, widely spaced trees with nothing in the understory and not a very hospitable environment for birds. If you tell the story about why it looks the way it does, it's going to help. Um, and organic. Again, it's, it's, it's uh, educating the consumer about what the difference is. I think there's a little bit of a risk because most sugar makers are doing uh, good management anyway, and so that differentiation, that, that wedge can be a little difficult sometimes, but um, without that third-party certifier, the consumer doesn't necessarily know. There are a few initiatives on the sugar maker side to try to educate consumers about that, but it doesn't have the weight or that name recognition that 
certified organic does. Yeah. Great. I'm ready to do some bird-friendly maple I shots. I thought that's hit me is, and don't let me, is that uh, trees growing for being tapped and trees growing for producing wood products tend to be mutually exclusive. I, you know, um, and the part, you know, I, you know, we grow, and so uh, the question I think about is, are those acres that are going into maple production? They tend to be areas that are fairly accessible. Are we in the timber industry losing acreage to that? Is this, you know, I, I, I this is just something that's occurring to me. Not, and now I'm not saying good, bad, or indifferent, but I'm saying there's, you know, somebody goes to making maple. When you decide to turn your bush into a sugar bush, it changes the whole plan, the long-term plan. So I was curious just to throw that out as a conversation. I would say that for sure the, the traditional sugar bush of a monoculture, uh, widely spaced, large, mature trees, um, you know, those are, those do exist, but I would say in practice, most uh, sugar bushes are converted from long-term timber management. Uh, so having the 500,000 taps behind the, behind the farm is, is becoming less and less common. And, and you know, let's face it, the, the growth, so in the last 20 years, Vermont produces about three and a half times the amount of syrup that we did. 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. um, that increase in yield in production is not uh, one for one for number of taps. We are getting more productive in taps, and that has mostly technology, increase in vacuum, use in, use in vacuum. But um, yeah, there's conversion of, of long of stands that have been managed for long term timber production. I don't think they're necessarily mutually exclusive, though. I think a lot of times the discussion is. Um, you're going to tap it, or you're going to manage it for long-term timber, or you're going to tap it and you can't do both. And yes, there's definitely a point at which you can't do both. But there are high, potentially high-value trees that could be excluded from tapping. You can. Uh, it has been discussed. You know, possibly changing your rotation for your tubing to align with intermediate cuts in the in the uh, in the stands. I mean, let's face it. You are you are putting a, a tap hole in the in the bottom log. But um, I don't necessarily think it's an either or. It has also had the amount of attention, both research and, and otherwise, in the last 20 years that, that just raw sap production has had. So I'm, I am interested in, in trying to get a little more attention paid to the forest management side. I, I, one thing I say is when you hear about it and say, well, you know, you, you're devaluing a tree that could potentially be, be veneer. It's like, yeah, okay, that might be true. Um, you could flag it and not tap it. But it's also like saying all your baseball cards in your box are Mickey Mail rookie cards. You know, they're not. They're, they're, there are some high value for sure, but um, I think it's important to, to be realistic too. So I want to shift gears again uh, a little bit to another topic about jobs, about the workforce in Vermont's forest economy. Um, logging is... Uh, uh, you know, seeing an aging workforce, uh, it's getting mechanized. Some of the logging operations have a lot more technology involved, um, and there's also the ability for people to be st to start up still the way the traditional way of a, a single operator with a cable skitter and a, and a good work ethic. Charlie, Ken, with your daily interactions with or your regular interactions with logging contractors, what do you think is the best way that we can uh, attract and retain and uh, sustain the forest in economy workers of the future? And maybe include foresters too. What do, what do you think, what are some strategies we can be thinking about to bring people into these jobs? I'd start in kindergarten. <laughs> because, uh, you know, and, and I think that's... The mic. Give me the mic. You know, I, I grew up in a, in a, in a uh, uh, ag versus forestry family. And growing up, for me to stick my hand up and tell the world I wanted to be a logger really wasn't highly regarded. Um, and, and the truth of the matter is that's still there. Um, and, and I really feel strongly that uh, we 
as an industry need to connect with that cultural aspect of our schools, and and I and I too feel that, that, that you know I need to be doing show and tells and, and bringing schools to see what we do, so that that young person who really wants to be a square peg is going to feel okay uh, because I you know the bottom line is we we need. We've got the trees, the trees are growing, there's no doubt about it. There's gonna be a market. The biggest challenge is finding those people that are willing to risk uh, the capital. And it, it, to face it, it's not an easy job. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a real physical job. Um, we don't need a huge number of people, we just need to be able to connect with the right people. That's, that's my take. So getting, getting this, uh, the kids in the schools to see this as, a, as, a, as an opportunity, I think is a, a good place that I see. So Charlie, beyond hiring kindergartners, what do you, what do you, uh, or, or did I get that wrong? Uh, you know, third, third grade. Third, third grade. No, so what, what do you, how about the contractors? You, you see boots on the ground. What are you seeing uh, for strategies that, that the loggers you work with are, are getting for putting, putting employees into the woods? Yeah. Um, so I think it's, I mean, like any of these things, it's multifaceted and there's no one right answer to it. Um, I think the education component is really important. I think um, tech centers, um, so uh, those programs for high school students who are interested in it, whether they grew up in it or, or not. Um, I work with one in Enosburg where uh, we have them out in the woods doing logging work, doing sugar work. Um, a lot of those guys, and women I should say too, transition right into that. Uh, those are opportunities as well for, for training for some of the newer technologies that are coming out, whether it's cut to link systems um, and kind of helping shift the workforce in that direction. Um, another component of it is making that line of work uh, affordable. Um, a lot of the work you've been doing, Sam, with working with work compensation. Um, other things like health insurance, it's like any, any industry, how do you make a living doing it? Um, and it's not just the fact that timber prices might be up and down, but it's the cost of doing business. Mm -hmm. And so if we can take care of those aspects, it'll make those kids more comfortable thinking about getting into it, and it'll make their parents more comfortable pushing them to do so. Um, you know, how many loggers have you met who, who look at their kids and they say, I don't like getting into this line of work. Um, but then again, how many logging crews do we work with that are family operations, um, whether it's multi-generational? Um, so if you can create the economic conditions where they can afford to do it, that's a, that's a huge part of, um, of allowing them to do it. It's not just the desire. So I'd say the economic or the education component is, is critical. Um, and, and as far as like kindergartners, I, I think you know whether it's get, exposing them to the skitter or, or not, but getting them out in the woods and seeing it, um, getting them on projects, getting them hands-on. Even you know there was a project in Starksboro a number of years ago where the kids went out and they went to an old sugar bush, it wasn't being tapped, I don't think. They actually went out and, and selected the trees with the forester to be cut. They cut the trees, they tracked them through the whole mill process, and they built their bookshelves and their library out of them. And now the kids can go back in with their parents and point to the tap holes and talk about forest management. Um, so, yeah, brainwash them when they're young. <laughs> well, I wanna, well, I'm going to add to that. I'll come to you, Mark. Um, you know, one of the things, and again, thinking about things you can do, right now there is a bill in Congress that's been introduced, the Future Logging Careers Act, that would allow us, right now it's, by federal law, you can't have even your own family members on a log job if they're under 18 years old. And there's a bill in Congress right now that would allow 16 year olds and up to work in mechanized logging operations. And that's something that if people are looking for action items is talk to our federal delegation about supporting that, uh, Congressman Welch, um, because that, I mean, that's where I come from. I'm somebody who wants to see my kids involved in working lands businesses, but when I'm told, you know, when, I, when I can't bring them legally onto a landing and, and teach them how to run a log loader and things like that, that's a, a difficult thing when, you know, I got my first new chainsaw when I was 12, and apparently my parents didn't know about the Future Logging Careers Act back then, but, uh, it's, but it's, that's something we can do. We have to take some of these barriers out of the way that exist, and, and there are people out there trying to do that, to be able to get people exposed to that. Mark. Well, I just wanted to chime in on the education front. Uh, I've been helping advise a UVM grad student and, uh, who's been working on a project related to Maple and, and, and uh, tech center education. So next 
Tuesday, we have over 50 kids signed up for a maple competition. It's going to be at Shelburne Farms. Mm -hmm. It's going to be about a two and a half hour uh, activity. They're going to have to be able to identify parts and pieces for a tubing system. They're going to have to identify uh, winter twigs. They're going to have to be able to identify uh, whether tapping was done properly or not. And then there's even a team competition. We've got eight schools uh, involved. And it's going to be the first year um, this has ever happened. So we're pretty excited about it. A lot of the tech centers have a maple program, some like Hannaford or like Cold Hollow. They have a really nice soup to nuts uh, operation, but not every school has that. And some kids only get a little bit, maybe two weeks, three weeks of, of information about Maple, and um, we've learned a lot in the last 20 years, and we're trying to incorporate more of that modern you know, research uh, knowledge into the curriculum, so um, it should turn out really well. Commissioner, are you, oh, I'm sorry, Abby, go ahead. Oh, may I have the mic? Yeah. <laughs> I just wanted to quick mention to when attracting employees, um, remember that holistic experience. That's what people are looking for nowadays, a quality of life, and I think outdoor recreation can add to that. Um, there's an example, it's not logging per se, but it's engineering. In the governor's address this year, he mentioned that an engineering firm right here in Lindenville, Vermont, um, is full. There's, you know, there's no unemployment there. They're not looking for anyone because they were able to advertise their jobs in a mountain bike magazine. You know, this is across the state where engineering firms have um, vacancies. Um, so I just think taking into consideration what else your area has to offer, um, or your forests have to offer, might play a role in, in attracting employees. Yeah. Commissioner, you've talked often about your work in Europe and the, the culture there and things. Do you want to expand on this a little bit, what, you, what you've seen successful over there? Well, sure, that was uh, about 100 years ago, but uh, I'm happy to dredge that up. And it, it, it is a point I do like to make that uh, gets to this awareness gap, the cultural divide. Um, that is, uh, Joel, you'll, you'll recognize this. I worked in my first job out of UVM Forestry School was actually in Sweden. Uh, and the short of it is, um, they take their forestry seriously, and um, there's, if not reverence, there's definitely respect for people who work in the woods. And that's just just eye-opening and, and really important, and uh, I'd like it to be that way here. Uh, I'd like to make a quick comment on the career tech ed stuff. Uh, Sam knows this. We've been um, kind of into looking at this and meeting with the, some of the centers, and what I can tell you is, uh, we have some fantastic facilities in this state and some amazing teachers uh, and very few students. Mm -hmm. uh, the students follow the, it's following the money game. That's a policy thing and I'm very happy to tell you we've engaged with Secretary French, uh, the uh, Secretary of Education. He's really into this and he's willing to help us. We don't know how to pull those levels, levers, turn those dials. How do you change that? We need, one is to destigmatize technical education. Uh, and there's a whole lot of kids in Vermont who, who for this is a great avenue. Uh, he's willing to help us figure out what policy shifts could help with that, uh, to change, to level the playing field. Uh, I think we all need to work on the destigmatization of working in the woods and help everybody understand there's a great life to be had, whether, I'd like to say, whether you're a, pencil neck forester like me or a robust logger like Sam, there's a good life to be had in the woods. Uh, and people should, it would be better if we all respected that and shared that. And I think that's part of the ongoing longer term approach. Yeah. Mike? Probably can't let it go without saying that uh, the, the woodworkers and wood manufacturers have similar issues with getting people willing to, to work in, in, in our shops. And uh, and I think it's also to, to note that there's more labor in turning that hardwood board into something than it was to create that board in the first place. So in terms of economic development and such, the more we can work those within within Vermont, the, you know, and, and, and it's a natural inherent uh, business for Vermont. You know, We've got the natural resource, let's use it more than uh, just cut it down and ship it out. Yeah. It is a con, I mean, I, I can't tell you how many how many phone calls, emails, uh, personal conversations I have with, with, the, with the people, business owners, regardless of the sector, looking for employees. There's employment opportunity, there's business growth opportunity, but we need the workers here. And uh, that, that's, that's a lot of what we're trying to do is make it more affordable to hire people and, and have, have employees in your, in your forced economy business. 
Um, I've got a question here from the audience for Mark. Um, is birch sap harvesting a potential growth market? And so, uh, for those of you who don't know, you can harvest sap from, from birch. It, uh, it is actually a different sap flow mechanism. Traditionally, we think about maple sap as being this freezing thawing uh, mechanism that involves drawing up of moisture during the freeze and then collecting it when it thaws the next day or whenever. It's very different. Anyone who's cut birch in the spring knows sap comes right up out of the, the stump. So yes, you can collect it. Uh, I guess I would ask the, the, the person who wrote the question what they mean by growth. Um, there are more people tapping birch now than there were 20 years ago. Um, there's definitely more taps uh, than there were 20 years ago, but it's still a tiny, tiny fraction of, of, of what maple is. And, and the other thing that birch has working against it is um, that it's turned largely into birch syrup, which your mind, all our minds probably immediately went to, oh, I wonder if it tastes a little bit like maple. Well, it doesn't. It's a totally different product. It couldn't really be more different um, other than it's a thick kind of sugary liquid. Um, so I think it has a bit of a branding problem, <laughs> but uh, there are people doing it, they're making it. There's not as much research on what the ideal silviculture is, what the, um, what the ideal forest management is for, for doing sustainable birch uh, production. It is, you know, I'm not, I'm not telling you something you don't already know, but it is a different species than maple, so it has a different life history. It had, you know, it, it doesn't live as long as, as uh, hard maple, although yellow birch is certainly closer to, to hard maple. Um, and it isn't used in the same way either. Um, some people will put it on pancakes, but I think it seems to be getting more attention from more of the culinary industry and you know, a uh, more higher end using it as a flavor, um, using a little bit as a flavor. So potentials there, we do have, we do have plenty of birch in the state, um, but I think we're at a very early stage, even though there are a few operations that are, I would say, relatively large uh, right now. Yeah. Great. Well, um, I have one last audience uh, related, or question from the audience, not related to the audience. Um, and this could be for any, Buddy, out here in the forestry world, uh, are forest ground or tree edibles such as mushrooms a potential growth market as well? And do we consider these to be forest products or are they agricultural products? Anyone want to take the mushrooms? <laughs> I'm not really sure what to do with that one, Sam. Mushroom question. Mushroom question. Our county foresters work with private landowners that uh, have all kinds of interests. So sure, uh, a variety of mushrooms that will grow in our forest, either wild or sort of wild cultivated, um, is an area of real interest and promise. And locally, some people make a few bucks doing it and have a nice little thing going. Uh, totally complimentary. Uh, these are in the general category that I think technically is <coughs> referred to as non-timber forest products. Um, uh, and they're forest products, for sure. And uh, ginseng is another, uh, other medicinals, f uh, floral products, um, and uh, greens. Uh, so relatively small scale, very hyper-local, but uh, offering promise and in the same category of you know, connections to the woods uh, and an integrated approach to managing the woods with multiple products. Um, I think it makes sense, and there's some promise there. All right, thank you. I think Mike hits me off the head with the idea that we're not going to like solve the economic problems we have by growing mushrooms instead of trees, but the ability to connect people with the forest through that. I mean, we had a workshop in Montgomery about how to grow shiitakes and lion's mane or then harvesting wild uh, mushrooms, and we had about 50 people show up to it. Yeah. And we were discussing where to bring them, you know, obviously an active timber sale. And so you get them out in the woods, and you're looking at mushrooms, but you're also looking at Subculture, and so it's wherever you can get your foot in the door with people to open their eyes to take what they love and connect it to what we all love. That's how we're going to grow the advocacy that's going to support us. So, um, yeah, I would just add that I mean, technically, maple syrup is a non-timber forest product. Right? I mean, it's a it opens a whole can of worms as far as how you define, you know, where it relates to forest management and uh, sure. it stands historically uh, managed for timber production. But, um, yeah, it's a, it's a 
Maple's in a weird in a weird spot, I would think, as far as you know the expansion and uh, the, at least in the last hundred years how we've managed our forests. So with that, we're, we're our time here is this is the, for this session is is up, and uh, I want to ask you all to give our panelists a good round of applause for their. Obviously, to stop by the next breakout sessions that are happening, we've got some great topics. Uh, if you tune into this channel tomorrow at the same time, we won't be here. Uh, but I certainly uh, look forward to visiting with you all throughout the next 24 hours here. Uh, so, thank you very much. Yeah. 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 Yeah.